Hello, Mark. My name is May from Sophomore, and my student number is forty-five. Today, I'm going to read an article called "Ten Ways to Have a Better Conversation" by Celeste Headley. All right, I want to see a show of hands. How many of you have unfriended someone on Facebook because they said something offensive about politics or religion? Childcare, food, laughter, and how many of you at least one person that you avoid because you just don't want to talk to them? Laughter. You know, it used to be that in order to have a poli- polite conversation, we just had to follow the advice of Harry Hagins, and my fair lady, stick to the weather and your health. But these days, with climate change and anti-vaccine. Those subjects, laughter, are not safe either. So this world that we live in, this world in which every conversation has a potential to devolve into an argument, where our polit- politicians can speak to one another, and where even the most trivial of issues have someone fighting both passionately for it and against it, it's not normal. Pew Research did a study of. Ten thousand American adults, and they found that at this moment we are more polarized. Polarized. We are more divided than we ever have been in history. We are less likely to compromise, which means we are not listening to each other, and we make decisions about where to live, who to marry, and even who our friends are going to be, based on what we already believe. Again, that means we are not listening to each other. A conversation requires a balance between talking and listening, and somewhere along the way, we lost that balance. Now, part of this is due to technology. The smartphones that you all either have in your hands or close enough that you could grab them really quickly, according to Pew Research, about a third of American teenagers send more than a hundred texts a day. And many of them, almost most of them, are more likely to text their friends than they are to talk to them face to face. There's this great piece in the Atlantic. It was written by a high school teacher named Paul Bornway, and he gave his kids a communication project. He wanted to teach them how to speak on a specific subject without using notes, and he said this: "I came to realize." After I came to realize that conversational competence might be the single most overlooked skill we fail to teach. Kids spend hours each day engaging with ideas and each other through screens, but rarely do they have an opportunity to hone their interpersonal communication skills. It might sound like a funny question, but we have to ask ourselves. Is there any twenty-first century skill more important than being able to sustain coherent, confident conversation? Now, I make my living talking to people: Nobel Prize winners, truck drivers, billionaires, kindergarten teachers, heads of state, plumbers. I talk to people that I like. I talk to people that I don't like. I talk to some people that I disagree with deeply on a personal level, but I still have a great conversation with them. So I'd like to spend the next ten minutes or so teaching you how to talk and how to listen. Many of you have already heard a lot of advice on this. Things like look the person in the eye, think of interesting topics to discuss in advance, look, nod, and smile to show that you are paying attention. Repeat back what you just heard or summarize it. So I want you to forget all of that. It is crap. Laughter. There's no reason to learn how to show you're paying attention if you are in fact paying attention. Laughter, applause. Now, I actually use the exact same skills as a professional interviewer that I do in regular life. So I'm going to teach you how to interview people, and that's actually going to help you learn how to be better conversationalist. Learn to have a conversation without wasting your time, without getting bored, and please God, without offending anybody. We have all had really great conversations. We have had them before. We know what it's like—the kind of conversation where you walk away feeling engaged and inspired, or where you feel like you have made a real connection, or you have been perfectly understood. 
There is no reason why most of your interactions can be like that. So I have 10 basic rules. I'm going to walk you through all of them, but honestly, if you just choose one of them and master it, you already enjoy better conversations. Number one, don't multitask. And I don't mean just set down your cell phone or your tablet or your car keys or whatever is in your hand. I mean be present. Be in that moment. Don't think about your argument you had with your boss. Don't think about what you are going to have for dinner. If you want to get out of the conversation, get out of the conversation. Get out of the conversation. Don't, but don't be half in it and half out of it. Number two. Don't pontificate. If you want to state your opinion without any opportunity for response or argument or pushback or growth, write a blog. Laughter. Now, there's a really good reason why I don't allow pundits on my show. Because they are really boring. If they are conservative, they are going to hate Obama and food stamps and abortion. If they are liberal, they are going to hate big banks and oil corporation and Dick Cheney. Totally predictable. And you don't want to be like that. You need to enter every conversation assuming that you have something to learn. The fam therapist M. Scott Peck say that true listening requires a setting aside of oneself. And sometimes that means setting aside your personal op opinion. He said that sensing this acceptance, the speaker will become less and less vulnerable and more and more likely to open up the inner recesses of his or her mind to the listener. Again, assume that you have something to learn. Bill Nye Everyone you will ever meet knows something that you don't. I put it this way, everybody is an expert in something. Number three. Use open-ended questions. In this case, take a cue from journalists. Start your question with who, what, when, where, why, or how. If you put in a complicated question, you are going to get a simple answer out. If I ask you where were you terrified, you are going to respond to the most powerful word in that sentence, which is terrified. And the answer is yes I was or no I wasn't. Were you angry? Yes, I was very angry. Let them describe it. There are the ones that know. Try asking them things like, What was that like? How did that feel? Because then they might have to stop for a moment and think about it, and you are going to get a much more inter interesting response. Number four, go with the flow. That means thoughts will come into your mind and you need to let them go out of your mind. We have heard interviews often in which a guest is talking for several minutes and then the host comes back in the, and asks a question which means like it comes out of nowhere or it's already been answered. That means the host probably stopped listening two minutes ago because he thought of this really clever question and he was just bound and determined to say that. And we do the exa exact same thing. We are sitting there having a conversation with someone. And then we remember that time that we met Hugh Jackman in a coffee shop. Laughter. And we stop listening. Stories and ideas are going to come to you. You need to let them come and let them go. Number five. If you don't know, say that you don't know. Now, people on the radio, especially on NPR, are much more aware that... They are going to they are going on the record. And so they are more careful about what they claim to be an expert in and what they claim to know for sure. Do that. Err on the side of caution. Talk should not be cheap. Number six, don't equate your experience with theirs. If they are talking about having lost a family member, don't start talking about the time you lost a family member. If they are talking about the trouble they are having at work, don't tell them about how much you hate your job. It's not the same. It is never the same. All experiences are individual. And more importantly, it is not about you. You don't need to take the moment to prove how amazing you are or how much you have suffered. Somebody asked Stephen Hawking once what his IQ was and he said, I have no idea. People who brag about their IQs are losers. Laughter. 
Conversations are not a promotional opportunity. Number seven, try not to repeat yourself if it's condensed, condensed thing, and it's really boring. And we tend to do it a lot, especially in work conversations or in conversations with our kids. We have a point to make, so we just keep rephrasing it over and over. Don't do that. Number eight, stay out of the weeds. Frankly, people don't care about the years, the names, the dates, all those details that you are struggling to come up with in your mind. They don't care. What they care about is you. They care about what you are like, what you have in common. So forget the details. Leave them out. Number nine. This is not the last one, but it is the most important one. Listen, I cannot tell you how many really important people have said that listening is perhaps the most, the number one most important skill that you could develop. Buddha said, "I'm paraphrasing. If your mouth is open, you are not learning." And Calvin Coolidge said, "No man ever listened his way out of a job." Laughter. Why do we not listen to each other? Number one, we would rather talk. When I'm talking, I'm in control. I don't have to hear anything I'm not interested in. I'm the center of attention. I can bolster my own identity, but there's another reason. We get distracted. The average person talks about talks at about 225 words per minute, and but. We can listen at up to 500 words per minute, so our minds are filling in those other 275 words. And look, I know it takes effort and energy to actually pay attention to someone, but if you can't do that, you are not in a conversation. You are just two people shouting out barely related sentences in the same place. Laughter. You have to listen to one another. Stephen Covey said it very beautifully. He said, "Most of us don't listen with the intent, intent to understand. We listen with the intent to reply." One more rule, number ten, and it's this one: be brief. A good conversation is like a mini skirt, short enough to retain interest, but long enough to cover the subject. My sister, laughter, applause. All of this. Boils down to the same basic concept, and it is this one: be interested in other people. You know, I grew up with a very famous grandfather, and there was kind of a ritual in my home. People would come over to talk to my grandparents, and after they would leave, my mother would come over us and she'd say, "Do you know who that was? She was the runner-up to Miss America." He was the mayor of Sacramento. She won a Pul- Pulitzer Prize. He's a Russian ballet dancer, and I kind of grew up amusing, assuming everyone has some hidden amazing thing about them. And honestly, I think it's what makes me a better host. I keep my mouth shut as often as I possibly can. I keep my mind open, and I'm always prepared to be amazed. And I'm never disappointed. You do the same thing: go out, talk to people, listen to people, and most importantly, be prepared to be amazed. Thanks. Applause. Thank you, Mark. This is the end of my recording.